Now on BBC One, the weekly, weekly magazine for the deaf and hard of hearing, see here. Today is Remembrance Sunday, and in an hour's time, at the Cenotaph in London's Whitehall, the dead of two world wars will be remembered. Jack Ashley was in the army during the Second World War, and he's here to give us an update on how you can claim a war pension. Every Remembrance Sunday, Memories of the war come flooding back to me. And I very vividly recall the older men in our street when I was a child telling us about the slaughter of the First World War. They talked about Flanders and Passchendaele and the Somme and a place they called Wipers. And these became sad but heroic names to us. And in the Second World War, there were fewer deaths on the battlefield, but there were still many personal tragedies. Well, my own hearing loss was nothing to do with the war, but I do know that many thousands of people had their hearing badly affected because of it. Last year, we told viewers how to go about claiming a war pension. So we were absolutely delighted to hear recently from a number of viewers who have successfully claimed since watching our programme. Bruce Doctor from Blackpool contacted us. I wrote to the department involved and got a claim form, filled it in and returned it. An audiology test was arranged at the local hospital and it was confirmed that I was eligible. Bruce Doctor is now receiving his war pension and he asked us to remind you of the way to make a claim. So here goes. During the war, very little was known about the damage that noise could cause. But we know now that gunfire and explosions can be very damaging indeed to human hearing. And even a couple of exposures, just one or two, can cause permanent damage. Paul Lewis is a specialist writer on social security and war pensions and he tells us who can claim. Anybody who has a disability now which they can link back to the war can usually claim a war disablement pension. There are two main groups. There are the people who are in the services and they can claim a pension if any event during their service caused them a disability now. And it doesn't have to be a, a disability caused through combat with the enemy. It can have been um, being a prisoner or an accident while travelling, an accident while training. And of course the biggest group of claims now come from people who had their hearing damaged. Even one exposure to loud noise such as gunshots or bombs, automatic weapons, can cause damage to the hearing. And those people can now usually claim a war disablement pension for deafness. The other big group, though not so many of them claim a pension, are civilians, and I think many civilians don't realise they can claim. Now, in that case, they have to have been damaged for either by enemy action, which principally means they have suffered from bombing or long-range shelling, or action to combat the enemy, which could be, for example, they had an anti-aircraft gun in their back garden, which damaged their hearing. And in those cases, most of the claims from civilians are for damage to hearing. So anybody who has any problem now, any disability, which they link back to the war, should claim a war disablement pension. Claiming a war pension itself is quite simple. You simply put in a claim to the War Pensions Directorate in Norcross, near Blackpool, and you get sent a form which you have to fill in. 
The important thing to remember is to give as much detail as you can, either about your service record or about the events that happened to you as a civilian. The claim takes a long time to process, though. A year is not uncommon, uh, and there are medical questions and sometimes a medical examination to be gone through. So it can take a long time, but the claim is quite simple, and there is a very useful helpline now that you can ring at any time to find out the progress on your claim. The amount of war disablement pension you get depends on the degree of disability. If your disability is the minimum 20% disability, then you get £17.80 a week. If it's as much as 100% disability, which obviously are very severe cases, then it's £89 a week. Both these amounts are tax-free. Uh, deafness claims tend to fall in the middle of that range, perhaps 40 to 60%. But even very mild hearing loss, you can get a one-off gratuity, sometimes of several thousand pounds. But the important thing people should remember is the amount you get is backdated to the date of your claim, no earlier than that. So the sooner you get your claim in, the more money you'll get. So if you think you're eligible for a war pension, write to the War Pension Directorate, North Fylde Central Office, Norcross Blackpool, FY5 3TA. I'll repeat that. It's the War Pension Directorate, North Fylde Central Office, Norcross Blackpool, FY5 3TA. Thanks, Jack. War pensions are just one of the many benefits provided by our social security system. There are many, many benefits available to young and old, families on low incomes, to people with disabilities, and one-parent families, and many, many more. But just how do you find out what benefits are on offer? and whether you're eligible to claim them. It's no easy task, and you probably need a degree in tautology to understand the leaflets in any case. So I was very interested to receive a copy of a video called Which Benefits? It's been produced by the Benefits Agency in partnership with the British Deaf Association. The 20-minute video gives a clear guide to the enormous range of Social Security benefits. It's signed and subtitled and presented by Carolyn Edwards and Clark Denmark. school before you're 18 but you don't have a job you're guaranteed a youth training place with a weekly allowance ask at your careers office or job center one thing everybody should get just before their 16th birthday is a national insurance number card it should arrive in the post your employer will need your number to pay your national insurance contributions. These entitle you to unemployment benefit, sickness benefit, and your state retirement pension. You will need your national insurance number when you claim social security benefits. If you can't find your number card, or you've never had one, ask your social security office for one straight away. Which benefit is packed full of information and stresses the range of benefits that you might be eligible for? It's free to deaf and hard of hearing viewers and you can get a copy by writing to the British Deaf Association, 38 Victoria Place, Carlisle, CA1, 1HU. That's the British Deaf Association, 38 Victoria Place, Carlisle, CA1, 1HU. 
Hello. Did you know that 20%, that's one in five, of BBC television programmes now have CFAX subtitles? My favourite programmes are feature films and Neighbours. But there are many, many others I'd love to watch, such as The Clothes Show and Kilroy, but I can't because they're not subtitled, so I'm denied access to them. It's only in the last 12 years that there have been teletext subtitles on television for deaf and hard of hearing people. The service has gradually grown over the years, and today the BBC averages 44 hours of subtitle programmes every week. By 1998, under the new Broadcasting Act, half of all television programmes will be subtitled. That's more than double the programming we now have access to. The most comprehensive survey of deaf people's views of subtitling has just been produced by the Centre for Deaf Studies at Bristol University. The Switched On report is 200 pages long and packed full of information. It represents the views of 2,500 deaf and hard of hearing people. The aim was to find out how satisfied viewers were with teletext subtitles. The good news is that overall viewers were happy with the quality but just wanted more. The majority of teletext users are over 60 and hard of hearing. Their needs are different to the profoundly deaf viewer. The report points out that television subtitles have the impossible task of meeting very different viewer demands. For some people, the subtitles are too slow, but for others, too fast. Clive went along to the BBC subtitling unit to find out more. Now, who actually decides which programmes are going to be subtitled? We work within a, a very general framework um, of attempting to subtitle all peak time programmes. And that's programmes running from early to late-ish in the evening. In the end, the decision on what gets subtitled rests with me. Right, but um, how do you decide on the speed of subtitling? We aim for a consistent reading speed of 120, uh, about 120 words a minute across all our programmes for adults. And that works out at getting on for three seconds for every line of text. And, and we believe that this gives people adequate time to read the text and look at the picture. Now this research project is complete. Have you got anything important from it? The research was carried out during the first few months of our live subtitling of the 9 o'clock news. And uh, we gained a lot of, of, of very um, useful and important information on how people were coping with what was a very new way of subtitling. This comment follows those of Cardinal Hume. Last week gave a personal warning that in the Borotown Middle East. Some people found in the early days of the subtitling of the nine o'clock news uh, found that the scrolling text was very difficult to follow. They weren't used to um, dynamic subtitles on the screen. Um, and add to that the fact that this was near verbatim text coming at over 200 words a minute we were asking a lot of people to read it. But we also wanted to deliver full information and accurate information. Access 
to live television news has been a real pleasure for many of us. It's good to know what's going on in the world like everybody else. But I hadn't realised until I started working with the See Here team that they have their very own subtitling unit in the depths of the television centre. <laughs> trying to find Paula's subtitling room, but this is such a big place, I keep getting lost. Ah, here we are. Now, now that you're studio director for See Here and you do the subtitles for See Here, doesn't that make your working life somewhat complicated? Not too much. It does mean I'm able to so follow something all the way through and I'm aware in the studio of the problems I'm going to have when I'm subtitling it. Uh, I do need to have two separate hats. I do find it difficult sometimes when I'm directing it. When someone says, how are you going to subtitle it? I say, I have no idea yet. I'll let you know that later. Can you explain any differences between See Here subtitles and Teletext subtitles? The main difference, of course, is that CFAX subtitles are closed so only people with a Teletext set can get them. All the subtitles that we do in this room are open subtitles, available to everyone. And in fact, there's no proof that Teletext ownership among deaf people is any higher than among hearing people. So for some people, the, our program may be the only program, if they don't have a tele Teletext set, that they have access to. Can you tell me what your views are on the Switched On report? The Switched On report was very interesting. It highlighted the problems that any subtitle program can only be a compromise. It's impossible to please all the people all the time. It's sometimes the reading speed is going to be too fast for some, too slow for some. The sequence, the items that they had about See Here was very interesting in that it showed that a number of profoundly deaf viewers did like to see the subtitles as well. And with that in mind, I'm trying now to adjust the subtitles depending on who the main focus of the screen is. If it's a hearing person talking, the subtitles will follow as closely as possible the speaker. If the main person on the screen is signing, then the subtitles will follow the sign as closely as possible, which means that the voice will be slightly behind. This really is a tiny room. How long do you have to stay locked up in here? keep the door open so I can see people going past. Um, it takes me about a day to subtitle a See Here programme, between eight and ten hours. We record the programme, as you know, on Tuesday, edit it on Wednesday, I spend all day Thursday in here, and we put the subtitles onto the finished programme on Friday, and it goes out on Sunday. Fifteen-year-old James Butcher wrote to See Here some months ago. He wanted to find out more about subtitling in the BBC for his GCSE maths project. This is the subtitling unit, this whole area. Now we're going to see someone over here. Hello, this is Debbie, and she'll explain the whole thing to you. Sit down here. Well, I've got to go because I'm very busy. I've got an awful lot to do, OK? We've just done a frantic ring round. OK, I'll leave it at that. I have to listen to uh, a sound chunk, a bit of speech. I have to time it using this machine. This machine will calculate the length of time it takes somebody to say some words. But because the viewer can't read as fast as people speak, we have to edit. We edit approximately by one third. 
I serve him some character, but different from others. The main difference between children's subtitles and adult subtitles is timing. Children can't read as fast as adults, so we have to leave the subtitles up for far longer on the screen. For instance, one line of text. For an adult, we'd leave it up for two and a half seconds, maybe three if it's a long line. For a child, a young child, it would have to be up on the screen for five seconds. Something as visual as sport, we think, well, there's more going on that people can understand without the words in sport than, for instance, in a film or a drama or a sitcom. Also, sports programs, even if they're pre-recorded, will edit, they tend to edit very, very late. So, uh, for instance, the Olympics, pre-recorded inserts in the program were probably recorded just a matter of minutes before they appeared on the screen. We hope very much, maybe next year, that we will be doing the sports night program that goes out on Wednesdays, I think. There's more information about subtitling and the Switched On report in this month's issue of the new See Here magazine. We'll give you the address at the end of the program. Sign language tutors urgently needed for two-year posting in the Gambia. An intriguing advertisement in the Guardian for the organization Voluntary Service Overseas. They specialize in sending skilled adults to work in developing countries. Here to tell us more is Lucy Cuthbertson. Hello, Lucy. Now, what sort of person uh, are you looking for? I mean, uh, you need someone with the right skill, obviously. I mean, who, who are you looking for exactly? Well, the request has come from a school in the Gambia. Originally, the advert was asking for sign language tutors in Uganda and the Gambia, but the job in Uganda has now fallen through for funding reasons, which is really is quite common with VSO jobs. So this one has come from a, the principal of a school in the Gambia for the deaf. It's the only one in the whole country. And they want somebody to work as a sign language tutor, developing the language that's already being used in that school, and really trying to create it into a national sign language. So you're advertising for someone from Britain who has the necessary skill in BSL, British Sign Language, who will then go and what are they going to teach? I mean, if they use BSL, are they going to teach uh, BSL to people there? I mean, can you go into it a bit deeper? Well, we're not looking for someone to teach BSL. We're looking for somebody to develop the language that's already being used. The only sign language that's being used in the school at the moment is a form of Gambian sign language, but it's not been formalized in any way. I think there are elements of British language in it, um, the principal of the school has been on a short course in the UK, but we want them to build and work with what the pupils are already using in that school, and certainly not to go in and teach British Sign Language. So what are the right qualifications for the person? Well, the headmaster has asked for some sort of certificate in sign language teaching, but we feel that if a volunteer looks at the job description and the requirements of the job and feels that they're able to do it, often the qualifications and the experience are negotiable. So paper qualifications may not be the most important thing in this case. Okay, but if uh, a deaf person gets this job, are they going to have an interpreting service provided? Well, this, this is a very new thing for VSO. We've never sent a deaf volunteer before. We've sent a few volunteers who have been hearing impaired, but nobody who's needed an interpreter. So all of that area is totally new, and we're obviously in consultation at the moment with the deaf community and asking for advice as, as to how best to go about and fill this job. If an interpreter is needed for the job, then that's something that VSO has to look into, and we hope it will be available. So 
So how soon do you need to find someone? The headmaster wants somebody to arrive in January, February 93. So it's pretty soon. Okay, Lucy, thank you very much. Thank you. But what's life like out there? What sort of experience is it in a developing country? Gloria Pullen has just been out to Uganda on a fact-finding research project and is here today to tell us about her trip. Hello, Gloria. Hello. Now, can you tell me very briefly, I mean, if... Uh, one arise in a country like this, what, of what sort of experience can one expect? Oh, you can certainly expect a culture shock. We grow up in Britain, we know about the housing, the food, the clothing, etc. So it's very important to be aware of the culture. And if you have that information before you arrive, it's the same for any underdeveloped country. So you've been out to do some research. What exactly was that for and why did you pick Uganda? Okay, I'll answer your second question first. Why did I go to Uganda? Mainly because they speak English, and I didn't have a problem with that. But obviously the sign languages are different. When I arrived there, though, I was told that there were elements of BSL in there because of the English people that went over, missionaries helping them out, and that sort of thing. They were probably actually using SSE. When the Britons gave them their independence, and the Americans came in, they were told then, oh, you don't want to be using English sign language, use American. And so they adopted the American sign language. Then recently I went out there and I'm saying to them, you don't want to be using ASL. Oh, should we use BSL? No, no. I told them they ought to use their own Ugandan sign language. And I think that's very important. We should respect each country's sign language. Now, what needs developing is their awareness, their culture, and their deaf identity, because they've had no traditional values at all. I mean, mainly as a result through the wars that they've had. And I'm sure there are lots of people in Britain that can give them a lot of help and support. Now, I'm hoping to stay out there for two years, mainly to find some deaf Ugandans so that I can actually get involved in the research and help them to look into their own culture and their own language. And that will probably take two years. Well, it sounds like a fascinating scheme. Can you very quickly tell me how many deaf people there are in Uganda? Well, that's difficult, actually. At the moment, they think there are about 30,000 deaf people there. But it does need researching. So you said hopefully. Well, I really do hope that it becomes reality. Thank you, Gloria. I need that. Thank you. If you want to find out more about VSO, you can find their address on page 492 of No Need to Shout. Or you can ring VSO on their new Minicom number. 081-780-2266. That's 081-780-2266. Well, that's all for this week. But don't forget, the November issue of the See Here magazine is out now. And that address is coming up right now.